open your Bibles to the Gospel of Luke, third chapter, verse 21. John the Baptist was in the waters of the Jordan River baptizing people when suddenly he looked up, pointed, and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. And he saw Jesus walking down into the water, asking John to baptize him. Jesus was baptized. In verse 21, we can read about it. When all the people were being baptized, Jesus was baptized too. And as he was praying, heaven opened, and the Holy Spirit descended on him like a dove. And then a voice from heaven came and said, You are my son, whom I love. With you I am well pleased. Now Jesus himself was about 30 years old, it says, when he began his ministry. A ministry that would last three and one half years. And at the end of that time, Jesus suffered a deadly wound when he died on the cross. But that wasn't the end of the story, was it? Because three days later, that deadly wound was healed and he rose again, ascended to heaven. And then he sent the Holy Spirit to perform miracles and wonders as the Spirit gathered the world in to God's church in order to worship the Creator God. Jesus, watch this, get it emblazed in your conscious mind. Jesus himself was baptized, came out of the water. The Father gave him his authority as the Messiah, empowering and anointing him with the Holy Spirit to perform his ministry for three and a half years. At the end of that time, he died, received a deadly wound. Then he was raised up again as that wound was healed. He ascended to heaven, sent the Holy Spirit to perform miracles. And by the power of the miracles, God gathered his people into his church to worship the creator of the heavens and the earth. That's the kingdom of God. But in Revelation chapter 13, we see something else. In verse 1, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. The dragon is the devil, remember? And I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. So there is the dragon, the devil, looking out over the water. And he sees a beast coming up out of the water. And then, watch this, end of verse 2, the dragon gave the beast his power, his throne, and great authority. So as the beast comes up out of the water... The dragon gives him his authority, and he was given authority. The Bible says in verse 5, he was given authority for 42 months. Now, do the math. 42 months divided by 12, that's three and a half years. Now, he says it in a different way because the beast is a counterfeit to the truth. Jesus' ministry, three and a half years. The beast ministry, 42. The counterfeit has to look like the real thing in order to deceive anyone. So he has his authority for 42 months. That's three and a half years. And then, look at verse 3. One of the heads of the beast seemed to have had a fatal wound. But the fatal wound had been healed. Are you beginning to see a parallel here? It's not over. Verse 11, another beast comes up out of the earth, but he had two horns like a lamb. 
But he spoke like the dragon. Looked like a lamb, speaks like a dragon. And not only that, verse 13 says, he performed great and miraculous signs, miracles. And verse 14, because of the signs of the miracles he was given power to do on behalf of the first beast, he deceived the inhabitants of the earth into worshiping the first beast Verse 8, all of the inhabitants of the earth will worship the first beast except for those whose names are written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb. Now follow what's happening. Just as Jesus came out of the water, the Father gave him his authority as the Messiah for his ministry three and a half years. At the end of that time, he was crucified, died on the cross, but he was raised up again, ascended to heaven, and sent the Holy Spirit to do miracles to gather the world into his church. So the counterfeit, the dragon, watches his son, the beast, come up out of the water. And he gives the beast his power and his authority, an authority that was to last three and a half years, 42 months, at the end of which he receives a deadly wound. The deadly wound is healed, and he sends the false prophet to perform miracles and gather the world into his church to worship the beast. dragon, the beast, and the false prophet or the counterfeit of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it is a counterfeit kingdom of God. He looked like the Lamb. Those who follow the beast think they're following the Lamb. They are deceived by the miracles. They are deceived by the power displayed. They are deceived by what they see and they can't hear that he speaks like the dragon. So the whole purpose of the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet is to establish a people who will worship the dragon. But no one will worship the devil. That's why he gives his authority to the beast. And those who worship the beast think they're worshiping God because he looks like a lamb. But he speaks like the dragon. The counterfeit kingdom of God is a counterfeit system of worship which we commonly would call a church. Shouldn't be surprised. We learned the other day in 2 Thessalonians, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica, and our being gathered to him. So Paul is talking about the time when the church, that's them and us, are going to be gathered to Jesus Christ. That's the rapture of Jesus Christ, our, of the church to Jesus, our being gathered to him. Look, we ask you, brothers, not to become easily unsettled or alarmed by some prophecy, report, or a letter supposing to have come from us saying the day of the Lord has already come. Oh, they thought that Jesus already came and they missed it. So Paul said, No, don't let anyone fool you in any way, for that day will not come until a rebellion occurs and the man of lawlessness, that's the Antichrist, is revealed, the man doomed to destruction. Don't let anyone tell you that Jesus has already come because that day will not come until the Antichrist, the man of rebellion, is revealed. This verse tells us that before Jesus comes to gather his church to himself, the Antichrist will be revealed first before he comes. And there must be a rebellion. Now the Greek word for rebellion, apostasia, means an apostasy. 
of falling away from the truth. So there would be a great apostasy, a greater falling away, and then the Antichrist would be revealed, and then Jesus comes. Now watch what happens. Verse 4, he, that's the Antichrist, will oppose and exalt himself over everything that is called God or is worshipped so that he sets himself in, in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. So the Antichrist sets himself up in God's temple and he says, I am God and he establishes himself as the one that should be worshipped by using the power of the dragon and his authority bestowed upon the beast and the power of the false prophet worshipping miracles. He says, I am God, worship me. Now he sets himself up in God's temple. Every place in the New Testament that uses the word God's temple or the temple of God, it is always referring to the church of Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone and we are the living stones in the temple. So the Antichrist then sets himself up in God's church and he says, I am God and practically the entire world including many in God's church will worship the beast instead of the lamb because he looks like the lamb. The word anti in Greek actually means in place of Christ. Anti-Christ means in place of Christ. He sets himself up in Christ's place. He says, I am Christ. Worship me. And the Bible tells us practically the whole world follows. And today, practically the whole world following the lead of popular book writers, novel writers like Dr. Tim LaHaye's Left Behind are waiting for the temple to be rebuilt and for the Antichrist to go in and to smash the temple and the altar and desecrate it with his filthy sacrifices overlooking the fact that the true temple of God is the church of Jesus Christ and Antichrist is doing his work in the church so that while all the world practically is looking to the Middle East and looking for Antichrist, one single man to come, Antichrist is working in the church and they don't even recognize him. Now I can show you one verse that dismantles the idea that Antichrist is one single individual that will appear in the future and destroy, rebuild the temple and destroy it. I can show you one verse that disassembles that whole idea. Do you want to see it? Well, I'll show you. First John, in the little book of First John, chapter 2. Verse 18, dear children, this is the last hour. It was written 2,000 years ago. And it's the last hour. And we think we're living in the last hour. 2,000 years later, how can that fit? Well, just keep coming. You will see, and that's an eye-opener. But look, dear children, this is the last hour. And as you have heard, that Antichrist is coming Notice, you have heard Antichrist is coming. Even now, many Antichrists have come. Now, it was written 2,000 years ago. And John said, you've heard Antichrist is coming? 2,000 years ago, he said, even now, many Antichrists have already come. I could say the same thing to you today. You've heard that Antichrist is coming? Even now, many Antichrists have already come. Hey, if they were here 2,000 years ago, then you'd better believe they're here now. Amen? Even more remarkable, 
This is how we know that it's the last hour. They went out from us. Isn't that exactly what Paul said was going to happen? There would be an apostasy. Apostasy means a falling away from the truth. And Antichrist would be revealed. Now John is saying, already they have gone out from us. There has been an apostasy and a falling away from the truth. This is how we know that it's the last hour. 2,000 years ago, many Antichrists had already come. We had better believe Antichrist is at work right now. Who is he? What's he doing? That's what we're here for. Dig a little deeper. Find the answers. Look at verse 8 of Revelation 13. All of the inhabitants of the earth will worship the beast except for those whose names have been written in the book of life belonging to the Lamb. Now, I want you to get a picture of what's happening. The real battle with Antichrist, his real objective is to somehow try to get your names out of the Lamb's book of life. That's what it's all about, folks. It's not about territory in the Middle East. It's not about oil wells in the Middle East. It's not about boundaries and places to live. It's about the cross of Jesus Christ. That's why he's anti-Christ. He puts himself in Christ's place. All the inhabitants of the earth. That means that this is a global system of worship. Not just some little church in some obscure place, but it is a global, worldwide system of worship that practically the whole world follows except for a few. A worldwide, global church that appears to be the kingdom of God. But it's a counterfeit. Not a perfect counterfeit. He makes some mistakes along the way. Verse 7 says he was given power to make war against the saints and to conquer them. So the Antichrist is a religious power, a church that has some kind of authority to persecute and make war against those who refuse to go along with its particular brand of worship. God doesn't force anyone. God woos us with his love. So who is the Antichrist? Let's go back to the beginning. And I want to start in Revelation 12, verse 17. And then the dragon was angry at the woman, and he went off to make war against the rest, or the remnant, King James says, the last of her offspring, the last of the seed of the woman. And we learn the seed of the woman is God's people, the pure woman. So the last of the seed of the woman, the last of God's people on this earth, who are they? Those who obey God's commandments and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Two points of attack at the end of this unfolding of the battle between the Antichrist and the people of God. He concludes in chapter 14, verse 12, this calls for patient endurance on the part of the saints who obey God's commandments and remain faithful to Jesus. So the two points of attack, like bookends on this passage of Scripture defining the Antichrist and his battle between himself and God and the people of God, the two points of attack, like bookends, are obedience to God's commands and the gospel of Jesus Christ. Keep that in mind. That's the battlefield. It's not the Middle East. The battlefield is 
faith in Jesus Christ. So then, 13, the dragon stood on the shore of the sea. In verse 2, I saw a beast coming up out of the sea. Who is that beast? He has ten horns, seven heads, ten crowns on his horns, and on each head a blasphemous name. The beast I saw resembled a leopard, but he had feet like those of a bear and a mouth like that of a lion. The dragon gave the beast his authority and power and throne. So picture this. The dragon, that's the devil, looking out over the water. He sees this beast with seven heads, ten horns coming up out of the water. And this beast with seven heads and ten horns, the Bible tells us, resembled a leopard, be their feet like a bear and a mouth like a lion. And the dragon gave him his authority. Leopard, bear, lion, and receives his authority from the dragon. Now the dragon is the devil, but remember the devil never works as the devil. He doesn't go running around in that little red jumpsuit, two horns on his head, long tail with an arrow on it. None of you would ever worship anyone like that. And he's trying to get you. He wants those who want to obey God and to cling to the cross of Jesus. So he doesn't go as the devil. He works as human instruments trying to devour Christ. First we saw him as King Herod, the pagan Roman emperor who tried to devour Jesus the moment he was born. So who does this pagan Roman power give his authority to? If we can find out who he gives his authority to, then we can identify this beast. At this point, John is saying, Stop. Don't go any further until you have read the seventh chapter of Daniel. Now keep that in mind. Look, the leopard, the bear, the lion, and the dragon gives his authority to that beast that looks like leopard, bear, lion. Keep that in mind. And now we turn to Daniel chapter 7. Remember, you have to understand the Old Testament before you can understand Revelation. Here's a place. In Daniel 7, verse 3, Daniel had a vision. He saw four great beasts, each one different from the other, come up out of the water. First one was like a lion, second one a bear, third one, verse 6, looked like a leopard. Sound familiar? Lion, bear, leopard. And then the fourth one, terrifying and frightening, so terrifying he couldn't even name what he was like or what he was. And while I was looking at the horns, he had ten horns. Now we've already identified these four beasts. Watch. Verse 17, the interpretation comes. An angel came to interpret it. And he says, the four great beasts are four kingdoms that will rise up from the earth. So if we let the Bible interpret itself... Are we okay with that? If you let the Bible interpret itself, then a beast is a symbol for a nation. And so Daniel is looking out over the water, and he sees four nations rise and fall. One symbolized by a lion, the other one a bear, the other one a leopard, the fourth one... Oh, he didn't know what it was. Too terrifying. We've already identified those four nations in Daniel chapter 2. Remember Nebuchadnezzar's image, the head of gold, breast and arms of silver, body and thighs of bronze, the legs of iron, and the ten toes? This time beast, the first beast, was the lion, Bab the Babylonian power, 605 B.C., ruling over God's people and most of the civilized world, overthrown by the Medo-Persians in 538 B.C., ruling over God's people and most of the civilized world, overthrown by the third kingdom. This one symbolized by the leopard with speed in the year 331 B.C., led by Alexander the Great, the Greek Macedonian Empire. And then in 169 A.D., 169, Greece was overthrown by the Caesars of Rome, that pagan Roman Empire, the two legs of iron, this time symbolized by that beast with iron teeth that devoured the nations, ruling over God's people even during the time of Christ when he was on this earth. No wonder he was so terrible and he had ten horns. 
the ten horns, same as the ten toes of Nebuchadnezzar's image when Rome was divided into the nations forming Europe. So we see an exact parallel of Daniel 2. This is a historical platform. This is so crucial for us to understand. The ten toes and the ten horns. Rome was divided. There was Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Rome was divided into the ten toes, the ten barbarian states dividing Rome into what we think of as modern Europe today. And three of those horns, he said, were uprooted before this little horn that came up. Now follow me. Daniel saw a lion, bear, leopard, terrifying beast. John saw a beast come up out of the water in Revelation. And he resembled the leopard, the bear, and the lion. Daniel saw Lion, bear, leopard, terrifying beast. John lived during the time of that terrifying beast, Rome. And he saw the beast, leopard, the bear, and the lion in the reverse order that Daniel saw. You see, that's how we know we're standing on solid ground. Folks, you have to have a historic platform to truly understand the Bible. When I was a young boy in school, I had to take history classes, and I didn't like history. I didn't care about the Persians or the me. Who cares about that? I want to play baseball. <laughs> I'm glad I learned a little bit now because it's important for us to know we're standing on solid ground. Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome, Rome was divided. In the middle of that division came the little horn. That would be the beast of the Antichrist. Now we have a solid platform to base our interpretation on. Let the Bible interpret itself. And you can't go wrong. So Daniel understood what was happening. The four great beasts, the four kingdoms, the angel said. And then in verse 19, he continued and asked him, I want to know about the fourth beast, the one that's different from all the other ones. In verse 20, I also want to know about the ten horns on his head and about the other one, that little horn that came up. He had a mouth that spoke boastfully, but he had the eyes of a man. He claimed to be God, but he was only a man. And so Daniel said, I want to know about that guy. So the angel continues with his interpretation. Turn to verse 23. He gave me this interpretation. The fourth beast is the fourth kingdom. Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, Rome. Fourth beast, Rome. Fourth kingdom. Verse 24. The ten horns are ten kings that will come from this kingdom. The ten horns have to come from this kingdom. What's this kingdom? Rome, the fourth beast. And then after them, another king will arise different from the earlier ones. He will uproot or subdue three kings. He will speak against the Most High. He will oppress the saints of God. He will try to change the set times and the laws. And the saints will be handed over to him for time, times, and half a time. Nine identifying marks of that little horn that are essential for us to identify because almost all Bible scholars will agree the little horn is the same as the beast of Revelation 13 and the Antichrist. When we identify the little horn, then you'll know who the beast is. So let's get to work. Nine identifying marks. We want to look at them quickly but thoroughly. First of all, 24, number one, the ten horns are ten kings that will come from this kingdom. This kingdom is the pagan Roman Empire divided into the ten toes of the ten horns. So the ten horns of the little horn that the little horn opposed, the ten horns among which she came, came from this Roman kingdom, not some kingdom in the future, but the same one that overthrew the third kingdom, the Medes and the Persians. That's important for us to recognize. 
and then after them, second mark, after them, after the ten horns divided the Roman Empire, after that, another king will arise different from the earlier ones, and he would subdue three kings. And he would have authority to persecute the saints and rule for a time, times, and half a time. So this gives us a bunch of identifying marks after the division of Rome, sometimes after the year 476 that we learned the other night was about when that division was completed by the barbarian invasion. Sometimes after that, this little horn would appear among them. So we should be looking for the little horn to arise sometime after, four, uh, after the year 476 among those divisions of the Roman Empire which is essentially Europe today. We should be looking for the little horn to arise somewhere in Europe after the year 476 AD. He would be different from the earlier ones and he would uproot three of those ten horns. And he would have power for time times and half a time. Now in order to understand this we need to go back into history a little more once again. Because in the 4th century, Constantine was the emperor of Rome. And he saw that out on the eastern front, the barbarian nations were beginning to nibble away and weaken his empire. And he had to do something to strengthen it. So Constantine did a couple of things. At that time, the church was rapidly growing through the Roman Empire. So Constantine joined the church. And that would give him credibility with many of the people in his empire. So he became a Christian nominally in name only, but he joined the church. But then he did something else. He moved the capital, which for so many years had been in Rome, to Byzantium out on the Eastern Front and changed the name from Byzantium to Constantinople after himself. So he could be right out there where the action was and help to hold his empire together. The problem was that practically the whole civilized world had become accustomed to looking at Rome for leadership. And when he moved, he left a political vacuum in Rome. And he knew that if he didn't do something, that some military man or some powerful person would arise and perhaps be a threat to the emperor himself with a military coup. So he had to put someone in charge at Rome. Couldn't be a military person. No, that would be too risky. But at that time, there was a very influential and powerful leader emerging in Rome. And that was the bishop of the church at Rome. So Constantine gave the bishop of Rome his power, his throne, and his authority. Constantine, the pagan Roman emperor who would try to devour Christ, gives the bishop of Rome, the church, his power, his throne, and authority. And now the bishop of Rome has not only religious authority, but political power because the Vatican became a nation. And he would be different from all of the other kings. Different because not only did he have political power, but he ruled the church of Jesus Christ. And for the first time since Christ established his church, the church would join together with the political powers of the state to enforce her doctrines and her particular brand of worship.
Now, the Bishop of Rome found himself bitterly opposed by three of those barbarian states, the Vandals, the Ostrogoths, the Heruli. They were Aryan tribes. They taught that Jesus Christ, the following the, do, the teachings of Marcus Arius, that Jesus Christ was not fully God, but he was somewhere between man and God. Rightly so, the church opposed the Aryan teachings found in those three tribes that followed Marcus Arius. The church has the right and the obligation to oppose lies against God. After all, it's the kingdom of God. But the church went too far in its opposition, and fighting broke out as the church used force. And finally... The Bishop of Rome summoned Justinian, who was now the emperor, and Justinian's troops uprooted and fought against quieting those three horns by the year 538. Just the way the prophecy said it would happen. And now the Bishop of Rome is virtually unopposed in his quest for power. Now, a lot of you have already seen it. I see your heads nodding. I see the, oh. And so I need to pause here for a moment and do a disclaimer. I think it's obvious that when Revelation says the dragon gave his throne, his power, his authority to the beast, and when Constantine gave his throne, his power, and his authority to the bishop of Rome, along with the historical setting, it becomes clear that the medieval church at Rome is the little horn, Antichrist. And be, I have a lot more to go, so don't think I'm jumping to conclusions. I'm not done yet. But I think at this point I need to make something clear. I'm not anti-Catholic. I'm not anti-Pope. I'm not anti-anybody. I am anti Era. I'm not talking about anyone's faith. There may be some of you here tonight that are a part of the Catholic faith. No, I'm not talking about you. I'm talking about a church that we're going to see, the medieval church, that made some serious, serious mistakes in a time period called the Dark Ages and John Paul II himself officially called a day of apology, fasting and asking for forgiveness for the sins of the church during that time. Now, personally, I think it takes a big man to admit that his church has made mistakes. And I respect him for that. I don't agree with him on everything, obviously. But we don't have to agree on everything to love and respect each other, do we? Can't we love each other even if we don't agree? My wife and I don't agree on everything. She likes the Dallas Cowboys. I still love her. <laughs> and so I'm not talking about your faith. I'm not talking about any individual. I'm talking about a dark period in the history of the church, even acknowledged by John Paul II, the special day of fasting and prayer. Folks, if we don't go back and look at the mistakes that were made then, how can we know we'll never repeat those mistakes in the future? And so I'm not doing this to be hateful and I know there are some people out there on the TV world and the news commentators that would consider what I've just said to you hateful I'm not being hateful we can love each other and disagree but I believe you're here because you want to know the truth Jesus said the truth will set you free so I'm not talking about any people per se I'm talking about a system 
of worship developed in the medieval church of the dark ages. And it says that he would have authority for time, times, and half a time. Now that sounds like a riddle, but it's really not that hard to understand. What does it mean? Time, times, and half a time. I could tell you, but I don't want to tell you because that's my private interpretation. I want you to get it from Scripture. How do we do that? Come on, talk to me. Compare Scripture with Scripture. So what does time, times, and half a time mean? Go back to Revelation. Remember Revelation quotes the Old Testament over how many times? 600. Here's one of those places. Revelation, the 12th chapter. Let's begin in verse 14. The woman was given two wings of a great eagle so that she might fly to the place prepared for her in the desert where she would be taken care of for how long? Time, times, and half a time. The woman symbolizing God's people would be hidden in the desert while the beast is doing his dirty work against the church. The woman is hidden in the desert. The same time, times, and half a time, God will always protect his people. But what does this time, times, and half a time mean? We'll compare it with Scripture. This time, same chapter, verse 6. The woman fled into the desert to the place prepared for her by God, which should be taken care of for 1,260 days. So time, time, and half a time. That's when God's protecting the woman. 1,260 days. That's when God's protecting the woman in the desert. So time, time, and half a time equals 1,260 days. Actually, it's not that difficult to see when you understand a few things. Time is symbolic for a year. Times would be two years, half a time, half a year. Time, times, half a time, three and a half years. 1,260 days. Now, this is the only time at Revelation now that I'm ever going to ask you to take my word for something because I just... Don't have time to prove everything tonight. But I'm going to prove it to you without a doubt on another night coming that in prophecy a day is symbolic for a year. So 1,260 days of time times and half a time, 1,260 days would be 1,260 years. By the time the bishop had pretty well squelched the major opposition to the church in 538, uprooting those three horns, 538 plus 1260 years after that, she would have authority. That takes us all the way to the year 1798. In 1798, Napoleon sent his general Berthier into Rome, express orders to capture the city. He captured Rome, captured the Pope, brought him back to Paris where the Pope died 1,260 years after the three horns were uprooted. Just exactly the way the prophecy said it would happen. But there are some other identifying marks that we need to recognize he said he would be a persecuting power, or he would oppress the saints of God. And then there's another identifying mark. This one, he would try to change the set times and the laws. He would try to change the set times and the laws. Now you have to understand, this isn't talking about Man's laws, they change all the time. Talking about God's laws. He would try to change God's laws and set times. Well, did the church ever do that or tried to do that? This is a book that's fairly new, the Catechism of the Catholic Church, even included all the teachings even yet today, endorsed by John Paul II as his imprimata and stamp in the cover meaning there's no false doctrine in this book. And here's what it says. The church does not derive her certainty about revealed truth from the Scripture alone. Both the Scripture and traditions of the church must be honored and accepted with equal sentiments of devotion and reverence. So what he's saying is that the church and her traditions are equal to the Scripture. 
Now, I'm going to show you some things about this. I'm just giving you a quick peek. I'm going to show you some things that are going to make your hair stand out on end and straighten. And if it's already straight, I'm going to curl it up for you. We don't have time to do all that yet. They would try to change God's laws, putting tradition over Scripture. And then we see another one. He would speak against the Most High. Revelation said he would blaspheme God. What does that mean? When Jesus was here on this earth, and he was to heal a crippled man, instead of just saying, I heal you, he said, I forgive you. Your sins are forgiven. Well, the church leaders weren't too happy about that. They picked up stones to stone Jesus. And they said, that's blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. That's blasphemy. Stone him. Well, they were right. Only God can forgive sins. But where they were wrong is that Jesus was God. Only God can forgive sins. Only Jesus can forgive sins because he's God. But the church teaches that there is a man on earth who can forgive sins. In Michael Mueller's book, The Catholic Priest, and this is carried over from the Dark Ages, Yes, beloved brethren, the priest not only declares that the sinner is forgiven, but he really forgives him. The priest raises his hand, pronounces a word of absolution, and in an instant, quick as a flash of light, the chains of hell are burst asunder, and the sinner becomes a child of God. So great is the power of the priest that the judgment of heaven itself is subject to his decision. Does a priest have the authority to forgive sins? But it was the dragon who gave the beast his authority. You're beginning to see how it all fits together. Lebe and Cozart's History of the Councils, volume 14, page 109. For thou art the shepherd, thou art the physician, thou art the husbandman, finally thou art another god on earth. He would set himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God. From the Catholic National, July 1895, the Pope is not only the representative of Jesus Christ, but he is Jesus Christ himself, hidden under a veil of flesh. He would set himself up in God's temple and say, I am God. And the whole world is waiting for the Antichrist to come and rebuild a temple over there. St. Bernardine of Siena said, Thus the priest, in performing the Mass, the priest may in a certain manner be called the creator of his creator. The power of the priest is the power of the divine person, for the transubstantiation of the bread requires as much power as the creation of the world. Dignity and duties of the priest, Alphonsus de Licori. Now the Mass is not just a worship service. But the priest, at the high point of the Mass, would take the bread and the wine and pray the prayer of transubstantiation. That means that he is actually converting the bread and the wine, not as symbols of the body and blood of Christ, but in the actual body of Christ and the actual blood of Christ so that the priest is offering Jesus Christ again as a sacrifice for the sins of many on his altar. Watch. The book, John O'Brien's book, The Faith of Millions. Here's the book. I'm just going to read it from the printout to save time. But it's right in here. He says, the power of the priest is equal to that of Jesus Christ because in this role, the mass, the priest speaks with the voice and authority of God himself. When the priest pronounces the words of consecration, he reaches up into the heavens and brings Christ down from his throne, placing him upon our altar to be offered up again as a victim for the sins of man, not once but a thousand times. The priest speaks and lo, the eternal omnipotent God bows his head in humble obedience to the priest's command. Now, my personal feelings is 
that that's blasphemous. That's my personal feelings. You have to decide for yourself. If you think that that's right, if you think that that's true, then that's fine with you and you between you and God. But I think that Jesus Christ died once for all 2,000 years ago and there's no need for him to be offered as a sacrifice again. And to me, to offer him as a sacrifice again is to deny the once for all sacrifice of Christ 2,000 years ago. He would attack the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's what got the attention of a Roman Catholic priest named Martin Luther teaching a class at the University of Wittenberg on the book of Romans and he discovered in the book of Romans that we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And he began to teach that in his seminary class. Rome got wind of it and said, whoa Luther, no more. You can't teach that. We're saved by faith and works, not by faith alone. And Luther said, that the Bible says we're saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ alone. And Rome said, Luther, you don't understand. The Bible isn't the only rule of faith and practice for the church. It's the Bible plus the traditions of the church. And Luther said, now I know who the Antichrist is. He would attack the law of God and the gospel of Jesus Christ. He put himself in God's place. Revelation chapter 13 Verse 18, this calls for wisdom. If anyone has insight, let him calculate the number of the beast. For his man's number, his number is 666. Six is man's number because he was created on the sixth day. Three is God's number for the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Three sixes would be man putting himself in God's place. In fact, long ago, one, one, one of the titles that some of the popes claimed for themselves in Latin words was vicarious filii dei. And it's interesting, when you add up the letters of vicarious filii dei in Roman numbers, they equal 666. Now that alone is no proof. Lots of names can add up to 666. But when you look at all of the nine identifying marks that we have seen that he would set himself up in God's temple proclaiming himself to be God, attacking the gospel of Jesus Christ, not overtly but by subtly introducing his own teachings, so many people began to leave Rome, so many people began to protest the doctrines of Rome that the church had to meet. So how are we going to stop these protesters? They were called Protestants. Lutherans. If you're a Lutheran, your church started when Luther understood this prophecy. If you're a Methodist, your church started when the Wesleys understood this prophecy. Reformed tradition, your church came into existence when Calvin understood this prophecy. Are you a Baptist? Your church began when Roger Smith understood this prophecy. The church said, what are we going to do with these protesters, these Protestants? Protestants are nothing more than one who believes in the Word of God only. Scriptures alone. What are we going to do with these Protestants? So they met at the Council of Trent to discuss this 18 years, 1545 until 1563. One of the things they taught was, if anyone says that a man is absolved from sins and saved through faith alone, let him be accursed. And the Council of Trent, now she has spoken like the dragon. Well, why doesn't everybody teach this today? 
if all the Protestant churches began with this particular interpretation. Surprising answer. You see, at the Council of Trent, they studied some other things, and there were two Jesuits that came up with two interpretations of the prophecy because all those Protestants were pointing to Rome saying, you're the Antichrist. How well are you going to do about that? So the Alcazar, Jesuit scholar, says, I got an idea. I can show you how we can prove that all the prophecies in the book of Revelation and the Antichrist and the beast are all dealing with the past fulfilled by Nero when it's all ended. So we can't be the beast. That ended hundreds of years ago. It's called preterism. Rivera said, well, I got a better idea. Looks like to me that Jesus is coming in the future. And Antichrist is in the future. So he put it all off in the distant future. We've been here 1,500 years, so how can it be us? We can't be Antichrist. Most Protestants have picked up that interpretation, followed by the Left Behind series, over 70 million copies in print. So which one is right? Is it all in the future? Is it all in the past? Or is it, as I like to call it, interpreted through the eyes of Christ? We can know who the beast is. The beast received a deadly wound in 1798, but Revelation says the deadly wound will be healed. And in a surprising way, we're going to see another world power emerge based on the foundation and the platform established by the church of the dark ages, the medieval church. We're going to see it again with more power, with more authority at the end time when the deadly wound is healed. We can know who the Antichrist is. We can know who the beast is, but you better follow the Lamb. And you'll never go astray.